Hey everyone, my name is Neil Schrader. I'm a staff engineer here at DigitalOcean, working on the networking stack primarily. So I focus on things such as VPC, load balancer, floating IP, data center architecture, a data path on the hypervisor, and the management of network state. I've been with DigitalOcean since pretty much the beginning, since we were a few folks in a room in Brooklyn, all the way up to the 500 or so person organization we are today. And it's uh, been a very interesting ride, to say the least. So today I'm going to be stepping through the story of a create. Basically, what happens when you request from our platform a droplet, either via the UI or the API. I'm going to focus on the API path today. How that comes from your external request all the way down to our infrastructure to a VM that's live on the internet that you can SSH into. So with that, let's dive right in. So in order to initiate a request on our platform via the API, there are four required parameters that we need uh, to be able to satisfy the request. So first off, we need to understand the size of the droplet that you want to create, the number of CPUs, memory, so on. Uh, we need to know the region that you want the droplet to live in. Uh, we want the name of the droplet as well and we'll need the image that is underlying the droplet, so the operating system that you want to use, Ubuntu, CentOS, and so forth. So inside of your Terraform configuration or whatever you're using to invoke our API, that comes to us as a post request to the v2 droplet endpoint in api.digitalocean.com. And uh, the very first thing uh, when you initiate that request is uh, DigitalOcean.com, the domain, we utilize Cloudflare's uh, services both for um, CDN uh, caching of static assets and also their DDoS protection. So once we proxy through Cloudflare, um, we're going to be ingressing into our load balancers in the New York region. So all requests, be there both Cloud and API, but also say www.digitalocean.com, our community site, our Hacktoberfest uh, assets, uh, they come into these load balancers and are distributed accordingly. But in the case of um, cloud and API, we're directed to a service that's called the Edge Gateway. And this is effectively our internal API gateway. So what this does is this provides a consistent surface that, that can be invoked and to route to various backing microservices. It was first put in place uh, when effectively the entire front end was built on Rails, uh, and we needed a graceful way to evolve out of that monolith into the microservice architecture that we live in today. Uh, it also provides common, common functionalities such as authentication, authorization, uh, rate limiting, uh, feature flipping, and uh, so any, any request that comes in, if it is authorized, we get that in the header, and then it's passed back to the backing service that that endpoint is going to satisfy. And uh, in the case of V2 droplets, we're passed to a service called um, the droplets public API. And all this service does is effectively make a translation of the HTTP request that's incoming into a GRP, gRPC request, which is what we utilize to communicate between services here at DigitalOcean. And uh, from there, that gRPC request is directed to a product service that's responsible for Droplet, and that is aptly named Droplet. <laughs> so we have a, a very um, discrete definition of product services. So 
a product service isn't necessarily responsible for the creation of the infrastructure that underlies it. A uh, product service is primarily focused on um, any sources of truth for the droplet product itself. So for instance, is uh, valid sizes that are available for droplets, uh, regional availability. Um, also ensuring that when a user requests a droplet, there aren't any overages in limits. For instance, if a user has um, too many droplets and that also accounts for any in-flight request. The actual VM itself is uh, a differing infrastructure service um, because not all VMs on DigitalOcean could necessarily be a droplet. Think for instance, uh, Kubernetes workers or uh, DBAS instances, for instance. Um, but so droplets, First responsibility when uh, it gets this request is it does the, the validation of sizes. Uh, it, it drops a message on the bus to alert DigitalOcean at large that, hey, this create request has been initiated. And then uh, after doing effectively that initial legwork, uh, it's handed to a service called Harpoon. And Harpoon is the service that has the responsibility of orchestrating all of the things that are necessary for VM creation on our platform. And I'll focus on what happens in Harpoon here in a bit. So now I'll focus on Harpoon's concerns. So the first order of business is to be able to get the droplet service everything that it needs to be able to get back to the user. And namely, that's um, the droplet's identity, a droplet ID that is associated with this request, and also an event ID that's associated with the create so that it can keep appraised of whether it succeeded or failed. At this point, we can say, okay, user, we've kicked off the create, and it's completely asynchronous at this point uh, for the success or failure of the creation of this VM. Harpoon now needs to have an understanding of where we're going to put this thing. And the service that's responsible for placement of VM and the selection of the server that the VM ultimately gets placed on is called Orca. And Orca is our scheduler. And it's responsible for effectively utilizing our resources and uh, in tandem with an on hypervisor service called Octopus. Uh, it also ensures that we have good in-hypervisor affinity as well as a well-placed workload inside of the data center itself so that we aren't, for instance, stranding resources. And an example of some of the rules that dictate workers' behavior are various administrative flags. There, there could be hypervisors that are known to be broken, that are currently being provisioned, that obviously shouldn't be placed on. And uh, cloud apps can effectively dictate that, hey, don't utilize this hypervisor quite yet. It has ongoing work or something happening in the data center with it. From here, we look at um, available resources. So CPU, memory, disk, we also pay attention to the locality of uh, VMs for users. For instance, are they, um, do we have too many VMs located on uh, the same machine? Like we want that effectively spread out to avoid as many single points of failure as possible. Uh, we also have fleet boundaries, which is an internal representation of say, differing hardware so that we, we can logically split up the data center um, if, if, we, if we are um, utilizing it for a different purpose, say, say a different product, uh, for example. And uh, in older data centers, we also have some network boundaries that we need to pay attention to in placement so that we can ensure that we have connectivity. So once we have an idea of the hypervisor that we're going to land on. Harpoon uh, now needs to invoke the IPAM service to be able to fetch the addresses that are associated with this droplet. And uh, it will also invoke, if, if it exists inside of a VPC, the service that orchestrates 
the private network, the overlay. And we'll, we'll get into more networking concerns a bit later on in this talk. But once, once it has these details and has populated the metadata that's, that's associated with this droplet, it's now able to invoke a regional service called Hyperkraken, which fronts the on hypervisor service called HVD. Now, HVD is um, the, the first uh, actual hypervisor service that we're going to be discussing today. And it deals in discrete events uh, that impact VM operations. So say power on, power off, resize, um, the pulling of the image. Uh, all of these concerns are effectively discrete idempotent actions that it's, it's responsible for making happen on a, a bit more of a granular sense so that say if it, if it gets restarted, it can continue the create event successfully or whatever, whatever event it happens to be dealing with, be it a migrate, a destroy, and so on and so forth. Um, Hyperkraken is uh, responsible for fuzzing that business logic up to Harpoon because Harpoon doesn't need to necessarily know every single step that's, that's responsible for the bring up and bring down of um, a VM. So uh, it invokes this regional service that then uh, tells HVD what needs to be done to be able to bring up the VM itself and it streams that status back to Harpoon, uh, which, which in turn keeps Droplet in the loop as to what's happening with the VM itself. And uh, so there are a couple of primary components of VM creation, namely storage, network, and the actual definition of the dimensions inside of the hypervisor. The next major order of business is to pull the base image that is going to be utilized for the droplet. Inside of DigitalOcean, uh, those, those are locally stored. So this is independent of block storage that can also be attached to a VM. Um, the thing that's running the base OS is, is going to be local to the hypervisor itself. So we need to make that transfer happen. And inside of each data center, there of course, exist many, many hypervisors, but also a bank of boxes that served as NASs. So they store the base images that are um, primarily used for new droplet crates, but also users' snapshots and backups. And uh, those images are regularly rebalanced across those NASs so that any that are used frequently or concurrently are spread across multiple NASs, or if one is utilizing more storage than some of the other, that we keep that somewhat evenly spread. So since we know what base image we're going to use for this VM, uh, we need to have an understanding of where it lives. On each of those NASs, there is a service called an image agent and what this does is it takes a regular inventory of what exists on that NAS device and reports it up to a regional service called the image indexer. And uh, when a VM is being created on a hypervisor, a utility reaches out to the indexer and says, hey, uh, I need this particular image. Where can I go and get it? And the image indexer returns, OK, go to this particular NAS. And then from there, it's pulled over via HTTP. And uh, that avoids effectively a single NAS being rushed and um, is the primary mechanism that we get an image local to the hypervisor. So uh, this image hasn't been customized in any way, shape, or form yet. So it doesn't have an idea of what, what it actually is as a unique droplet. And image customization uh, is a critical component of how that happens. So to make, make an image unique, uh, we need to change four primary things. It's a uh, host name. We need to add any SSH keys if they were specified. We need to set the root pass. And uh, we also need to populate the network configuration. And uh, the primary mechanism that is responsible for this is uh, 
in the image, there's, there's a service called CloudInit. And CloudInit has an understanding of whether this is the first boot of a droplet image being made. And if so, it reaches down to what's called the metadata service. Um, this service just provides information about the droplet itself. So it can ask about its own identity. It can be reached on a special address inside of the link local space, 169.254.169.254. And then CloudInit um, reaches down, gets, gets all of this information, and then configures itself. And at that point, it's now able to be brought up uh, on the network uh, with all of the networking information that was put in place. And uh, that's, that's how that image becomes just a generic vanilla image to an image that can be utilized for a droplet. So now that HVD has coordinated pulling the base image from image management onto the hypervisor, it's now time to turn our attention to libvirt and uh, the definition of the VM itself. This is somewhat where the rubber meets the road. This is where we define how many vCPUs we're going to allocate for this droplet. Um, we define the amount of memory that can be used. Uh, we define the network interfaces that are going to be present inside of the VM uh, with their, uh, the MAC addresses that are going to be used. Um, we put all of this together in an XML definition that libvirt can utilize and then we define that domain. At this point, we can then uh, start the VM itself. Um, and this is the first time that we actually have a QMU KVN instance process present on the hypervisor. Now, we still need to do some management of resources local to the hypervisor itself. Uh, we want to make sure that these vCPUs are pinned in an optimal manner so that we can uh, efficiently utilize the CPU caches and that we don't have any um, bad memory access patterns, for instance, crossing NUMA boundaries, because that can drastically impact performance and show up as steel inside of the droplet itself. Now, the service that's responsible for this pinning is called Octopus. And if you remember earlier, Octopus works in tandem with Orca, our scheduler, to work out um, workload placement of future VMs inside of the data center itself. So um, yeah, Octopus uh, is, is going to make sure that we're pinned in a way that the VM will perform well. And the final remaining thing that needs to be taken care of is end-to-end -end connectivity. So in order to provide connectivity to the droplet, there are two discrete things that we need to deal with. One is how we get traffic from the edge of the data center down to the hypervisor that hosts this droplet. And then there's the question of inside of the hypervisor itself, how we go from the front door, which is effectively the bond, to the VM itself, which from the perspective of the hypervisor looks like a tap interface. So, and uh, how do we define, uh, I guess, the network characteristics as to things like firewall or like uh, any network policies that we have associated with this droplet? So I'll deal with each of these a bit independently. Um, a little bit of context on the data center itself. So at the, at the very top of the data center, we have our edge devices and those peer with our internet providers. And that's where we're announcing our publicly routable space. So IPv4, IPv6. Below those um, in each of these independent zones, we have um, some core switches, which tie together a tier of spine switches. Those in turn below them have um, a bunch of leaves and or top of rack switches, which have individual racks of hypervisors attached into them. So the question here is, how do we deal with 
all of these host routes for VMs that need to be mobile to be able to move around the data center in a graceful way. And uh, the way that we deal with this in our routed design is um, utilizing MPLS. Uh, so above the top of rack switch, imagine it kind of as like uh, almost an overlay as it were. MPLS works by associating a label on top of the ethernet frame itself. And what this allows us to do is make it so that the gear up there doesn't necessarily have to inspect the IP header to have an understanding of where this particular frame needs to go. Uh, it can look at that label and to be able to get it generally where, where it needs to go, like to the appropriate top of rack. And then once, once we get to that point, we can get it to the hypervisor itself. And uh, so on each hypervisor, we have a peering relationship with its top of rack to be able to announce its loopback address or the address in which it's known to the data center itself. And whenever a droplet comes in and out of existence, uh, we need to announce its host route somewhere and to be able to give it a hint as to the label that's going to be associated with it. So each hypervisor appears uh, with a route server, which is connected over to the core, that whenever, um, whenever we have uh, a droplet that we need to coordinate connectivity to, we announce its host route up there. It uh, gets its MPLS label. It's, it's kind of like fussed away so that we get generally to the top of rack where it needs to go. And then eventually down to its destination hypervisor and on the front door. So high level, that's how that works. On the hypervisor itself, we need to be able to get this frame from the bond to the tap interface of a droplet. So inside of, a, inside of the droplet itself, you might see ETH0, ETH1. On the hypervisor side, that could be associated with the equivalent of a tap0, tap1. And uh, on the hypervisor, we have a software bridge where all of these interfaces are connected together. And the software bridge that we're utilizing is called OpenVSwitch. Now, OpenVSwitch differs from, say, the Linux bridge or um, your general learning bridge um, in that you can arbitrarily define how the data path works. It's not necessarily the case where you plug into this thing and it has an understanding of what MAC addresses live there um, by virtue of the traffic that's flowing in, in and out of it, you utilize a protocol called OpenFlow, which uh, effectively states since we know what's present on the hypervisor, we can um, direct traffic accordingly in a more direct manner um, and be able to carve out our own data path and make this software bridge behave however we, however we wish. So at, at this particular tier, this is where we make the guarantee that, um, say, the IP address and MAC pair that's coming out of, out of a VM is what we expect to. We, this is where we apply security policies, either um, administrative policies or user policies that have been defined through firewall. We define NATing policies to be able to make, say, floating IP work and also coordinate overlay networks for VPC or private connectivity. And um, so we, all of this is defined in, inside of this bridge itself. And uh, once we have the open flow, um, that data path effectively carved, uh, we can make our way from the bond of the hypervisor up to the droplets tap interface. Now, in practice, how this is all orchestrated is um, continuing along in the HVD VM create path. We attach in the tap interface to open vSwitch, and then we gather all of the network state that uh, we, we need to be able to define that data path. And uh, we invoke another hypervisor local service called HVFlowD. And HV FlowD takes this big network struct and translates that into the necessary open flow 
to be able to configure the software bridge uh, to be able to guide that path from bond to tap. And it also coordinates the announcement of that host route so that we can get from the edge over to the top of rack, down to the hypervisor, and finally back up to the VM itself. And then from there, you should have a pinging droplet. Now it's just a matter of reporting success. So at this point, HVD has effectively completed the VM creation process. And uh, it's been streaming its status of, of this particular job back to Hyperkraken, which in turn is reporting back its status to Harpoon. And so HVD, having been convinced of the success of this operation, um, informs Hyperkraken, and Hyperkraken in turn informs Harpoon that it has successfully finished. Harpoon does a little bit of record keeping to be able to mark this event as success and uh, to signal that on um, a compute bus that the droplet service is listening to. And droplet sees, oh, okay, this particular droplet has been created successfully. And uh, droplets asynchronous workers can essentially, essentially tie up the loose ends that are necessary to finish up uh, the droplet itself. Namely, that comes down to allocating uh, PTR records, uh, reverse DNS records, to the droplet's name, now that it has an address and everything. If no SSH keys were specified, uh, droplet will also create an email so that the user can be able to access the droplet. And uh, then it drops a message on a bus to tell DigitalOcean at large that this create has been um, a success. And that in turn is how we end up uh, billing for the droplet itself. So a little more record keeping. And then finally, at this point, we have a fully baked droplet that is reachable on the internet. And that effectively is the story of a droplet create on our platform. So I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to listen to me.